who was Jesus? The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Advocate, Almighty One, author and perfecter of our faith, our friend, the Bread of Life, the Bridegroom, the Chief Cornerstone, the Beloved Son of God, from a virgin he was born, the Good Shepherd, the Great High Priest, he's faithful and true, the Holy Servant, the Deliverer who makes all things new, the Lowly Servant, the Great I Am, an indescribable gift, the Light of the World, Emmanuel, is us he's always with, the Judge, the King of Kings, the Lamb of God, the Lord of all, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Mediator for when we fall, the Messiah, the Mighty One who sets us free, our hope, our peace who died at Calvary, the Prophet, the Redeemer, the Risen Lord, the Rock who won't move, the Savior for all, the Son of Man, the Door, the Way, the Word, the True Vine, the Truth, the Victorious One, the Resurrection of Life the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the good shepherd, our good, good father, the greatest teacher, the goat, that's Jesus. Well, Merry Christmas. If I've never met you before, my name is Dustin Turner. I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church, and I uh, just want to share a brief message with you tonight about Jesus. And tonight, we culminate everything that we've been doing this Advent season as we light this Advent candle that represents Christ. And I want to read for you. From Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. I think one of the blessings of the season of Advent and what is Christmas is that it comes around every year, right? There's something about this season and there's something about this day where we're able to celebrate this every single year. And at the same time, there is a danger for each one of us because we celebrate it each and every year. The truth of the message can become commonplace for us. At worst, maybe it can become even stale to us. And what I want to do for just a few moments tonight is I want you to think about this story anew. I want you to think about it with fresh eyes. I want you to think about it as if you're hearing it for the very first time. Maybe for some of you, you are. Maybe this is the first time you've really heard the story of Jesus or you've thought about what Jesus means to us coming to earth. Over the last several weeks in this series through Advent called A Very Vintage Christmas, what we've been doing is we've been looking at key figures, key uh, characters, key people in the story of Jesus. People like Mary and Joseph, the shepherds. Last week we looked at Simeon and Anna, and tonight we're culminating this whole thing by looking at Jesus. And in particular, I want to focus in on one lesson that I think Jesus teaches us. It's the lesson of humility. Jesus himself embodied humility. In Luke chapter 2, just in verse 7 alone, I want you to notice something that Luke tells us about Jesus. He says simply this in verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn 
son. Everybody say son. Now here's the crazy thing about the Christmas story. Sons are usually what? Human. God is not usually what? Human. Jesus, in coming to earth, embodied humility. He embodied humility by coming from heaven because he is God and it is in heaven where God dwells and exists. And he came to earth and he put on flesh. Just pause for a moment and think about that reality. Paul said it like this in Philippians chapter 2. He tells us to have this mind among ourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to describe Jesus, who, though he was in the form of what? Or who? God. Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of what? A servant. By taking the form of, of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Paul says a whole lot here in these three verses. Jesus emptied himself. What he means by that is all of the privilege and all of the honor that he had as God, he emptied. He said, listen, I'm not going to uphold that. Instead, I'm going to become human. And in fact, listen to the way that Paul describes Jesus. He took the form of a servant. Is there not a humbler position than that of a servant? He took the form of a servant. He was born, just as Luke said, that Jesus was the firstborn son of Mary. And he was born in the likeness of men, meaning that when people saw him, when they touched him, when they talked with him, he was what? Human. He was man. Jesus is the Son of God incarnate. He is fully God and fully human. This is the story of the gospel. That God did not leave us in our sin and our brokenness and the evil that's in our world, but instead, he stepped into time. He stepped into history. He became human, not at the expense of his divinity, but he added his humanity to his divinity. Jesus, the divine son of God, embodied humility by taking on humanity. But Jesus didn't just embody humility, Jesus modeled humility. Go back and look at the story in Luke chapter 2. Just two very simple things that Luke says in this passage that I think speak to the way, even as an infant, even as a newborn, Jesus modeled human humility. Number one, Luke says that she laid him in a manger. A manger. Literally, a feeding trough where farm animals fed out of. And I'll remind you that the story of Jesus is that Jesus is not just human, but also divine, also God. And this person who was God and king of the Jews modeled humility by not being placed on a throne, not being surrounded by the best of everything, but simply being laid in a manger. And Luke says all of this happened because there was no room for them in the inn. Imagine if everyone around Jesus understood who he was, they would have found a place. They would have made room for Jesus. But instead, he modeled humility by being born where they kept the animals, by being placed in a manger. Again, the Apostle Paul says it like this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, not speaking of his birth, but speaking of his death. It says, of being found in human form, he what? Humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death 
on a cross. I think the interesting thing about Jesus and his humility is that often when someone is humiliated, it's inflicted upon them. It's done to them. But Jesus models humility, and he does that by taking on that humility himself. It is a self-sacrificial humility. It's a self-surrender. It's a self-renunciation. Jesus says, listen, even as God, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to do this. Jesus' whole life, from manger to grave, was marked by genuine humility. The birth of Jesus demonstrates the humility Jesus both embodied and modeled. And so this Christmas, there's two things really that I'm praying for myself and that I'm praying for you. The first thing is this, I pray that we would worship our humble Jesus. Right, I know the next 24 hours get a little crazy, don't they? If you have kids, if you have family, everything can get lost in the busyness of life, even in these next 24 hours. But what would it look like for us tonight to truly worship Jesus for who he is? What would it look like for us tomorrow in everything that we do, from the opening of gifts to the meal to the nap after the meal, right? To everything. To spend those moments worshiping Jesus for who he is. But not just tomorrow. What about next week? Or even continuing into the new year to recognize Jesus embodied and modeled humility and he deserves my praise. He deserves my worship every moment of my life. I pray that we would worship our humble Jesus. But number two, I pray that we would follow our humble Jesus. I pray that tonight, tomorrow, next week, next year, you might think to yourself, how can I take the form of a servant? How can I self-sacrificially humble myself for my life to not be about me, but for it to be about God and for it to be about others? Because that's what Jesus did. As we close our evening worshiping Jesus, I pray that you'll reflect on those two things, that you would worship our humble Jesus, that you would follow our humble Jesus. And in this moment, as we light these candles, symbolizing, yes, the light of Christ, I pray that this light might be a symbol for you. It might be a reminder for you of the humble Christ we serve the humble Christ we follow and that he deserves our worship and that he deserves us to follow him.